Professor Rosanga, if, if a, a woman like Xavier were, was to come up to you and say, I want you tonight, what would your reaction as a man be to that approach? Well, thanks very much, but I'm quite happy as I am. <laughs> uh, I think we, we wouldn't get anywhere by looking at individual cases. Uh, obviously, whatever you're looking at in behaviour and attitudes and so on, there is overlap between males and females. The differences are on the average. To say that there's Mrs. Thatcher is not to say that all women are like Mrs. Thatcher. To look at Mrs. Hollander, we can't say that all women are like Mrs. Hollander. Thank you God. must take large-scale studies into account which take a random sample of the population. This has been done with respect to sexual attitudes. And uh, in the last 20, 30 years, there has been no change in the differences between males and females. Uh, the males are still uh, much more promiscuous, uh, much more out for sex, women for love and affection, and so on. There has been no change at all in the respective values uh, that these two groups have. And I think it is important to recognize that the differences between males and females Certainly behavior has changed in the last 10,000 years from the hunter in the field and the woman with the needle and all that kind of thing. But these differences are embodied in our genes and they still come out very strongly. Now, I wouldn't like to go with Tennyson uh, about this command and obey. Uh, I certainly wouldn't dream of commanding my wife to do anything and she wouldn't dream of obeying. This is not the right kind of uh, comradeship that you expect in marriage nowadays. Uh, but for the rest of it, there is certainly some truth in what he said, that there are very fundamental differences between males and females. Again, not between every male and every female. There is overlap between the two. Some women are very masculine in their attitudes and their behavior and so on, and some males are relatively feminine in their attitudes uh, and so on. But on the average, there is a very pronounced difference between the sexes in the attitudes to sex, uh, to things like um, being in command, wanting to have power, uh, and so on. Uh, a typical example, for instance, is uh, Israel, the kibbutz, uh, where they passed a law that at least one third of the um, presiding uh, group should be feminine, and the women just wouldn't play. They weren't interested in that kind of power, they had more interesting things to do, and I must say I would agree with them. And how about China, where if they restricted families, like they can only they have one child, if they don't get a boy, mm -hmm. if it's a girl, they I don't know if it's still now prevalent, but I mean they'd have to just slaughter the, the they often slaughter the daughters. Yeah. But I okay, think aren't we aren't we already predestined by birth? Boys get blue and girls get pink, you know, before you're born even. Oh, what they are don't. we gonna I was, <laughs> I was knit pale yellow. <laughs> I'm, I'm, worried by these, very I'm worried by these sweeping generalizations about what's happened in history. I disagree with Hans about the, the data on lack of change in the last 30 years. I think a number of studies do suggest that attitudes towards sexuality and sex roles have changed quite dramatically. And you're, you're arguing, I think, that attitudes towards sexuality haven't changed. In fact, they have. I mean, a lot of studies on, on undergraduates of the most available population for doing research on do show that in the last 30 years, uh, women are much more have become much more willing to, to participate in, in se fully sexual relationships. They've got fewer hang-ups about it. They want more from the relationship. They're much less coy than they used to be. And there's plenty of evidence for this in a number of studies. And I, I quite agree other studies don't show this, but there's, there's plenty that do. But I'm much more worried by David's historical perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking Tennyson as though he was accurate right up to about 1900. The, the Victorian attitude to sexuality is a very brief period. If you read the Malleus Maleficarum in 1467 or something, it sounds something like um, all women are um, governed by insatiable lusts and also to satisfy them they consort with devils, which is the origin of demonology. Now, that may be a rather extreme view, but certainly the Victorians managed to invent 
this passive submissive asexual female. They were prior to that, homosexual right? Women. Prior to before that, prior to that period, yeah. women were, were taken seriously as sexual beings, sometimes terrifyingly seriously. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that period, we've rediscovered female sexuality. I think we should be very careful about Victorian era because we've all grown out of the Victorian era and are shedding it as fast as we can. If we, in many different ways, we mustn't forget it's a very brief period of historical time. Yeah. I mean, even in Shakespeare's well, time, typical. female sexuality, female assertiveness in all areas of life was much more expressed in his plays than, than, than happened in a later period. And uh, I think that's a very, I think we've been, we're very tempted to take the Victorian era both as a, as a great baddie and the great goody era, but also as some kind of universal truth. It wasn't. It was a brief historical period. Came reflecting in with the industrial revolution, revolution and possibly yeah. a reaction against the, 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 the rather peculiar society of the 18th century.